The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. My talk today is going to be a little different than what we have seen so far. It's going to be a little bit more on the concrete material itself. And what I'll be uh, just bringing on a small note, technical note on here today, is looking at the concrete deformation and failure behavior and looking at the difference in behavior when you have a controlled uh, temperature test versus that of a standard fire test like the ASTM E119. And um, I uh, should say now I'm no longer in the Department of Civil Engineering. We're now the Department of Civil and Architectural Engineering. So it's actually very exciting for this type of work here that we can, we can collaborate. So I took here from the literature uh, a picture that I know that many of you have seen many times before uh, on um, the uh, post-fire uh, uh, picture of two columns, uh, one normal strength column and one high strength column. And looking at these um, columns, obviously there are you know, a striking difference. One is that one seems to have uh, experienced a lot of spalling and the, not, and the other one not. However, they both failed. So one of the um, behavior that you observe with this type of testing is that the deformation characteristic throughout the fire has been very different. And these uh, columns have been subjected to the same kind of fire curve, but the deformation is very different. So the upper curve shows a normal strength uh, concrete, this normal strength concrete column, and the lower, the high strength column. So the, there is an initial expansion in the normal strength concrete and then a contraction. And in the high strength concrete, you hardly see much of an expansion. And um, this is one of the phenomena that concrete gives us is that this change from uh, expansion and contraction. And in particular, when you deal then with the additional difficulties of spalling, how do we model this? And, and especially because we know that temperature predictions are fairly well established. Uh, you can uh, measure them, you can calculate them. It's, that is a fairly uh, common and known parameter. So um, from these tests, basically the failure of these columns was governed by the strength of the concrete because the concrete takes on more and more of the load as the steel uh, reduces its capacity. And of course, the concrete strength also changes with time. So um, what we need to then figure out is we have to take into account the whole load intensity uh, factor and how that changes throughout the fire. So the motivation for my technical note here is can we really use data from um, experiments on materials, smaller specimen sizes, to get the performance, the behavior, the deformation, the failure load to that of a concrete specimen that has been subjected to an ASCM E119 fire and what are the similarities and differences. So in uh, this study, I used three different uh, concretes and I won't go through all of the results, but basically uh, they are all limestone concretes and they have different strengths, 50, 77, and 100 uh, megapascal. And the specimens in the experiments that I'm running are all conditions that they allow to dry out. So they're getting down to between 80 and 87% internal relative humidity. And for the higher strength uh, concrete, uh, they were conditioned at 45 degrees C just to bring them down to that uh, relative humidity or I would have no furnace left. 
Um, the specimens that I'm using uh, are not large. They are 100 by 100, and then they have different lengths of 400 and 900 millimeters. So here you see the uh, uh, furnace that we used in this experiment. And on here, you have uh, the loaded specimen, and here is the ram. And on this side, you have an unloaded specimen. Then it is mounted with or installed with a lot of thermal um, thermocouples, so we can get the entire profile for the specimen throughout the fire. And um, also, we can uh, get the uh, thermal, uh, free thermal expansion at the same time. So in this talk right now, I'm focusing on the loaded specimens. So the testing procedure uh, was that um, we had the, the prison specimens. We aligned them in the furnace and uh, spent quite a bit of time aligning them up so we didn't have any uh, or very minimal eccentricity. We set up the free expansion prison for the same reason and with the same um, conditions, and we then preloaded the concrete specimen. So the preload is applied, it's allowed to sit and settle with the system, and then at that time you start the temperature profile. And then you keep the load on, and we, in our experiments, kept the load on through the cooling phase as well. But I'm going to focus, in, focus here on just the heating part of the curve. So. Um, in this um, plot here, I'm showing the temperature development for a standard E1-19 uh, uh, fire test. And you see here the temperature development just outside the surface of the concrete specimens and then at the quarter and the core temperatures. So you have the, the near surface temperature. And in this case, our a uh, fellow specimen that was loaded failed, so that's why the, you have the turn off of the furnace here. And then here you have the core temperature and the quarter temperature profile for the, for the specimen. And in this case, of course, you have a large gradient immediate um, at the surface as you expect, but as you get to the quarter and in towards the center, it is a more uniform temperature. So here, in this plot here, I'm showing the temperature development for a specimen that is in a controlled uh, heating rate. So it would be 1.5 centigrade per minute or 2 uh, centigrade per minute. And in that case, you have this different profile. So in this case here, you have the surface, the quarter, and the core, and they are very similar throughout. And in this uh, experiment, the temperature um, set point was 600 degrees. And um, the, the pink line here is uh, the surface or the environment, so uh, just outside of the specimen. So again, in this experiment here, we do not have a large gradient, but they, that is in that outer quarter. So when we are uh, looking at deformation in concrete, we have, uh, of course, the total deformation as we measure in our experiments. And it's important to understand that uh, it, we have some separate components that are behaving very differently. So uh, for us right now, we're t talking about the total strain, the total deformation, as it was for the columns in the uh, literature and as well as in this study. And the components of strains that we are inducing is the thermal strains and the transient strains. So the transient strains are the strains that developed when you have a sustained load level. So whether that is 40% of the coal strength throughout the entire test, or if it is 30% or 50%. So here you have some of these curves that you can obtain during the controlled heating um, rate test, and this is what typically is reported in the literature where you have um, a total strain here for low specimens, and then you have the increasing temperature. So here in this uh, green set of curves, you have for two different concretes and a very low load rate of about 17%. And you have a little bit of expansion, then you hit a certain temperature here, and then you have a, 
a sharp contraction and eventually failure because these were all had, uh, set to an 800 degree Celsius set temperature and obviously they failed before they got there. So this uh, different curve here, this purple curve is for 33% and there is a little bit of expansion originally and then it um, decreases and that set temperature for these two were actually 600 so that's why I'm not showing any failure. Then this set of curves is for 50% low rate and you see these two uh, specimens both failed. So um, this is uh, the curve for the 50 megapascal concrete and this is the curve for the 77%, 77 megapascal concrete. So if you then uh, run these same type of um, prisms, but you're subjecting them to the ASTM fire, then what happens? So in this case here, I'm showing uh, two results here from the standard uh, control test with a, a heating rate of uh, two centigrades per minute. One showing here is one that had the set temperature of 800, and of course it failed before it got to that. And this other one had a set temperature of 600. But the load rates were only 17%. So taking those same um, prisms or a different set of prisms, subjecting them to also 17%, you see that there is some similarity early on, but then they deviate significantly uh, from the uh, control test. But then uh, when you're adding up and adding just a little bit more load, 25%, uh, you do get sort of similar behavior, but then you have a failure that is slightly before that. But still, what you notice is there is a big difference between the two. So when you take a look uh, in the, to the furnace during the fire, you can actually see that this is the loaded specimen. And you see here along this line here that you have the spalling that had developed. And the spalling is happening when the core gets, or that surface temperature, of course, get around 110. And but in this case, most of the spalling had happened and finished around the 110 uh, Celsius core temperature. In addition to that, you did see when the, t when the temperature got up to around 450, 500, a lot of the specimen developed this longitudinal crack that went through the entire specimen. So this behavior was similar for both the 16 uh, or the 17 percent and the 25 percent uh, loaded uh, specimens. And in our case, when we loaded the specimen to 33 percent and ran the ASTM uh, test, we had um, just explosive spalling too fast and it couldn't handle that. So that was because, again, the specimen is probably a little too small to handle any um, spalling. But if you take then into consideration that uh, in that region of the midsection where there was uh, quite a bit of spalling happening about this uh, temperature, and in some of the specimen it was by 15 to 20 percent spalling. And then if you adjust for the load intensity for that, um, you then um, can see that, you know, so on average those uh, specimens that I'm showing here actually follow the 0.33, uh, the 33 percent load curve for the control test. And it also corresponds well to that load intensity that you have uh, actually uh, reached after the spalling has occurred. So this uh, indicates that it is uh, adequate to use these uh, smaller specimens and the results in their behavior, deformation, and in strength, and extract that to large-scale um, structural behavior as long as you have this accurate. Because there has been a lot of talk about whether this is even realistic. Are we making some big, big assumptions here? Is this? Um, just a, like a pie in the sky kind of analysis, but this is, I think this sort of indicates that we, we can make this as long as we do take the spalling into account, and I know there are a lot of people that are working very hard on that, so I think that, that we should just keep on that path and keep working on it and keep developing those rational models for design.